Uh oh, we are live. Guys, caught me in the act getting my hair fixed. Uh, to everyone, welcome to the first uh, episode of uh, Finance Musings with your host Sajin Doshi. Uh, feels weird saying my name in the third person. <laughs> uh, but jokes aside, this is something that uh, I'm really, really uh, excited to do because one. Uh, you know, when I started all of this, like four years ago, you know, creating content about, Hey, how to get into investment banking, career advice, cold emailing, networking, and all that, you know, I spend a lot of my time, my weekends, I wake up and I'm reading the economist. I'm reading Barron's I'm reading PE hub. I'm reading middle market daily. You know, I'm on seeking alpha. I love reading about the market about companies. I'm reading investor presentations. I'm going through 10 K's. Um, and it's just something that I love doing. Right. And what I realized I was that something that I could do that could help uh, could help the students that, that I'm working with is that they were always like, hey, Sajin, why don't you do a separate podcast aside from the career stuff and talk about just, excuse me, just talk about some of the stuff that you're reading about, companies you're looking at, um, and just talk to that because, you know, there are so many different things going on in the financial market, uh, in the financial markets. And I don't think... You know, if you go on and nothing, nothing against like CNN and uh, like, you know, CNN, CNNBC or like Bloomberg, but oftentimes it's, they're not giving you kind of in-depth uh, news, right? It's kind of like, Hey, here's the market oil up, oil that there's interviews, the interviews are great. And you need that. You do need that type of daily commentary. Right. But what I, what I really was like, you know, there's nothing there where there's, there's a singular voice where it's like, hey, let's actually thematically look at a sector or a stock. Uh, let's have that type of discussion, really getting into the weeds of something. And that's what I wanted to do, right? And that's kind of the premise uh, and purpose of this podcast is that, you know, uh, every two weeks, uh, I, I want to do every week, but I feel like it will be a little difficult to, to analyze a company in depth in a short amount of time. You know, you do need time, whether you're kind of, scrubbing through their filings or investor decks, earnings call transcripts. I mean, this stuff does take time. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a weekly episode, but the episode will probably most likely be the bulk of it will be me speaking to a stock that I really like. And the back half will be just some like interesting, you know, news snippets or things that I've read or things that are happening, you know, whether it's a fund that's raised X amount of money or the, you know, the L what LPs are thinking, what are some deals that are happening in the marketplace, you know, whatever that I'm genuinely reading about that I find interesting that I feel like I can provide, uh, you know, good commentary on, I will do that. Obviously, yes, I'm plugged up. Why wouldn't I be? It's my podcast. So yes, I will have uh, a bunch of gear on right here. So actually wait cameras here how to get into investment banking obviously uh rocking and supporting the podcast hat and then i think on the other on the other podcast some of the some students were like hey sajin we see you with the shameless uh shameless plug yeah you're only one cold email away will always be my mantra but anyway look i want to dive into um the episode thanks for putting up with that intro if anyone made it this far if i'm actually having anyone who hit the three minute mark please reach out to me i'll give you a shout out on the next uh <laughs> on the next episode but uh full disclosure the company that i'm going to talk about as of today uh as of september 12th 2021 i do not own uh any shares in this company so just full disclosure i don't own any shares on this and again um this is not investment advice this is just kind of my thoughts uh, on the stock, on the company, uh, and the company that I'm going to be talking about, excuse me, let me have a sip of water. Shout out to Essentia, not sponsored by them, but again, openly taking sponsorship. So Essentia, please reach out to me, you know, have a few water companies that are interested for this prime table real estate, right? So <laughs> if you guys want to sponsor, uh, finance musings, please, uh, reach out. Cause, uh, you know, this, 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 uh, this table space will run out quickly, but, but it's actually fitting that I'm holding a water, a plastic water bottle because the company that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, guys, is Berry Global. And what I what I really like about this company, and before I kind of dive into what a lot of people probably have not heard of this company, and that's just objectively true. I don't think a lot of people know uh, oh, what is this know of the company, and I do think it's somewhat of like a, a hidden gem, and something that I do like about this company, just objectively speaking, is that when you think of like a boring business, and I hate to say that because I don't think it's a boring business. I think this is a fascinating business with a wide range of, you know, end uses and customer markets, but Barry Global 
they were taken private. Uh, sorry, they were owned by Apollo and taken public by Apollo. Uh, wow, almost two decades ago, I think 20, uh, 2002. I was reading their prospectus uh, earlier this week. But the great thing about this company is that it is like, a lot of people just frankly do not know that Barry Global exists. And I was one of those folks up until like a year ago. I was like, Barry Global, who are they, right? <laughs> but what, what Barry Global does uh, at a high level, excuse me, as a, a, a brief background on the company is that they are a plastic manufacturing company. And uh, what does that mean? What does plastic manufacturing mean, right? Is it just someone who's making plastic water bottles or, or liners for, for, you know, covering like food packaging? What does that mean, right? But when I say that their scale is global and their scale is immense, their reach is immense, it is, right? Because if you, their customer list is wide ranging from, you know, Heinz, uh, you know, Kraft Heinz, you know, Nestle, P&G, uh, Clorox, Walmart, Kimberly Clark, Unilever, Target, Pepsi, you know, you name it. And essentially what they're doing, right? They're taking a resin, which is again, a plastic resin. And they take that plastic resin and um, they're creating plastic packaging for a wide variety of end uses, right? End applications, right? So it's not that they're going directly to the customer. You know, there is a company in the middle. The company is like, hey, we have now received this plastic resin that Barry has molded into something that we need it for. And now me as a company, I will go and take that plastic and then apply it to my end use for whatever uh, that may be, right? So again, at a very high level, think of a company that is literally making the the plastic for your yogurts your condiments uh providing things like food bags and trash bins and grocery bags etc right and when you look at their when you look at their business there are three segments right excuse me they have uh consumer packaging which is again ear what i just said right now again things like containers bottles etc then they have their second segment which did well during covid which is hhs which is their health hygiene excuse me, and specialty. So this is things like literally what I just said. So surgical masks, medical gowns, disinfectant wipes, etc. And then the third piece is engineered materials, which is like e-commerce, um, sh shipping plastic, stretch films, um, trash can liners. And when I say films, I just realized people may not know this. I just, again, when, I, when you read through their K and you see examples of it, their films are quite literally, you know, and people ask like when you, you, you people don't know that these type of things exist right you go into a supermarket and you see your meat is covered in uh let me just try to blow this up a little bit you see like your meat is just covered with a plastic film and you're like oh like who's doing that right well hey there's a company like Barry global that's getting the plastic resin from one of their suppliers and they go in and they make plastic materials like literally something that covers uh <laughs> that is covering uh the meat in your supermarket etc right so I'm going to dive into each one of those segments a little bit deeper, like consumer packaging, uh, engineering materials, and then HHS or health hygiene and specialties. But on the earnings call and everyone, they, they just say HHS because health hygiene and specialties is a mouthful. So again, diving deeper into consumer packaging. I know I, know I said it's like everyday things, um, you know, like tubs and cups and lids, et cetera. But what's really unique about this is that if you think about what these end uses are, right? And again, when I started the, this podcast, I talked about the scale uh, of Barry Global. And, and when I say that, you know, you might think it's a boring company, but boring is often good because boring is, is like that steady state, right? So when you think about, you know, what an end use for this is, right? Where is this customer going anywhere, right? So when you think about like food service items, containers, bottles, prescription vials, that's really consumer packaging. And there's always going to be a demand for that, right? And and I'll speak to kind of how the, the numbers for each division were affected during, uh, I was going to say during EBITDA, but during COVID, you would think that some of these uh, segments that the end use is more of like a consumer oriented end use would have been impacted negatively. And, and there are some stories there where it's like, hey, these things did surprisingly well during COVID. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead to HHS because what was really interesting for me for the company is how well they pivoted during COVID. They didn't, I don't know if they broke some of this stuff out in as much detail as some of the earnings calls last year. They were, I don't think they did because this would be very internal data maybe, but they're, HHS overall did do well compared to some of the other business segments during COVID. Because if you think like face masks, medical garments, uh, you know, that stuff obviously given the COVID environment has been ramped up. So it'll be interesting to see what that pullback might be, or maybe we're in a new environment and era where some of that stuff is, um, is required, right? Speaking, just now going back to engineered uh, materials, 
when I said uh, things like, again, food wrap, trash bags, uh, specialty liners, this liner market, you know, I, I know it sounds amb- it's hard to kind of picture what that is. So I know I tried to give an example. I know the folks at, on YouTube, you could see it. I have it pulled up on my screen. But again, folks who are kind of listening, uh, who are listening on Spotify or SoundCloud, again, literally this is the, the film plastic stuff that is covering your baked goods, your frozen foods, your dry food. So again, you can see how immense that reach is, um, you know, of a company you know, at a level, you're like, oh, plastic manufacturing. Okay, cool. They make garbage bags. But no, you know, it's so much deeper than that. It's plastic is involved in so much uh, in our lives, right? Whether it's a liner on a binder or a, a plating or covering on a desk, right? And this is just the, you know, ketchup package, uh, right? This is just the end use for uh on, on the customer right they there's also commercial uses right which i'll get into some of the bigger larger uh commercial aspects right of like packaging and boxes right of how berries touching on all of that okay so i know i kind of really dove uh dive really deeply deeply excuse me into uh kind of through those segments uh but before kind of going to the financials and and kind of diving deep into hey what are my thoughts what's my perspective on the market what is their acquisition history been what's been the history of the company etc something that i i want to touch on that that's really important is oftentimes you see great investors that are always say hey what makes a good business what is the moat uh of the business and barry has a plethora of those right so i'm gonna i'm gonna dive right in again and for folks uh i will put a link if you're on youtube there should be a link at the bottom where you can see kind of the the one pager uh with notes so you guys can just either read that while you're listening to keep along um or just for folks who are listening on the podcast you can go download excuse me download it later excuse me so again uh four things that make it a a really really good business uh and kind of has that moat right so one is truly the scale of the company that i didn't appreciate the scale of the company uh and how low certain they do have variable costs, obviously, in terms of the resin that is the is the biggest. It's like I think roughly fifty percent of their cogs, but for the most part, the scale that they have and what that scale allows them to achieve in terms of being a low cost operator and the profitability that they can drive through that. And that's something regarding operating leverage that I'll talk to a little bit lower on. Second thing is that throughout all of their product lines, right across any of their divisions, they are either number one or number two in either one of those categories right so again some of their uh whether their competitor is like an amcor or something like that they're either right there with them or they're at number two right um another thing is that they are one of the largest largest supply i was gonna say suppliers buyers of resin and if you think about it if you're buying billions of pounds of anything in the world right of whatever it is that you're buying billions of pounds of uh, you're going to have a lot of unique insight into that market as well, right? Forget about the the scale savings that you're going to achieve uh, uh, by purchasing this much resin. You're going to have great insight into, hey, what are my different suppliers doing? What are some of the trends that are happening? What are some of the arbitrage activities? How are some of these input costs going to affect the costs that I can ultimately pass through the through to the customer or not? And this is a lot of, I mean, look, this is stuff that they're not going to disclose in their K or what have you. But again, this is the type of the data that internal to the company, you know, you best believe that their fp team, their strategic financing, growth op teams, uh, whatever, you know, they're taking those input costs of like, hey, you know, so again, what is an input cost, right? Things like oil, uh, oil prices, how does that affect uh, the plastic resins that we're going to make and you know mold into whatever our clients want what is that supply chain going to look like and how is that going to ultimately affect the the end costs that we can pass through uh to a customer right and how does that affect our profits and our margins and all that so again if you're buying billions of pounds of anything any material you're going to have that insight because you're working with these suppliers right on a daily basis right to procure what you need so not only from a supply chain procurement perspective but then also from like hey what have our historical trends been and what do our customers want so they have a lot of insight into that uh now again people are probably like hey sajan well if they're just buying all this resin you know is there a risk is there some sort of concern right but the reality is is that not only are their largest supplier from what i've gathered of kind of ripping through their case to the best of my ability i want to see if they have the exact number i thought i had it bookmarked uh, for those who are wondering, I'm just looking at their queue from July 
of 2021. Um, I, I mean, I really wish I had a bookmark, but point is, I don't think any one of their suppliers uh, accounts for maybe 10 to 17 percent. I could be wrong on that. I want to confirm that. Um, I don't. Yeah, I'll I'll go. I'll come back to it. I'll figure out where I flag that in the queue um, and come back to you guys. But something that I also want to point out is when I spoke to the scale of the business right now, I think as of they they are they, they just actually opened a facility in India. And I don't know if that takes account from 82 to 83. But as of right now, they have 83 uh, facilities across the world. So what, what does that mean? Right. Majority of them are in the U.S., I think 65 to 70. Uh, and then the rest of the 20 or 15 or so are international. But why is this important and why does this information matter if you're an investor and you're thinking about the business, right? Again, if you're a global conglomerate like a P&G, uh, a Kraft Heinz, uh, Starbucks, right? And you're looking to source uh, and, and you want to have as a customer, right? Starbucks, they want to have the most cost effective supply chain period, right? So forget about, you know, Starbucks sourcing their coffee or whatever, but think about, you know, their, 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 their cups, right? Their lids, their straws, um, and the input costs that Starbucks has. So Starbucks can work with a company like Barry, uh, and be like, Hey, Barry, we're planning to open a Starbucks in India, but we want to have a lot of say in how that packaging looks for us, right? How does a cup look? How does a cup design look? Now, while Barry could very well mold the plastics in America and work with Starbucks in America and ship it to India, wouldn't it be more effective if, um, excuse me, wouldn't it be more effective if Barry already had a facility in India, right? And now it's like, hey, Starbucks, guess what? We can just do this for you in India because we have a facility right here that's maybe meant for like healthcare garments or whatever, but our facilities have like a cross functionality, right? So when you're thinking about it as an investor, it's like, wow, like, okay, cool. You know, this is pretty neat, right? They have the ability to go to a customer and be like, Hey, based on your needs, we can help lower your costs because of where we're positioned, uh, internationally, what our international footprint is. And those cost reductions that we're seeing at a truly, you know, this is not just like, a, a, like a reduction out of thin air. This is truly like, Hey, the input cost of that goes into paying a liner and customs and other fees. We don't have to pass through you guys, right? Because we can just design this cup and ship it to you and integrate with your supply chain, right? Again, that is literally an illustrative example, but that is the example of, uh, and it's illustrative to, to, to a point because I will, I get to this later in my presentation is that Barry does a very good job of matching a, every dollar in CapEx. I, again, I, I want to make sure the math is right on this, but for the way I see it is that every dollar in CapEx will be met with a dollar in revenue generated. Because what this means is that every facility that Barry is building throughout the world, it is usually tied to some sort of customer contract or some customer saying, hey, we have these needs, we want to build, excuse me, we have this need, you know, in this country, we want to, ha we want to have access to, to, to be able to do this in this part of the world. So Barry will make that capital investment to support a customer in that region of the world, right? So all the capital that they're deploying, you know, it's going to get paid back, right? At least dollar for dollar. And then once that once those fixed costs for that facility are met, most of these facilities are cross-functional, right? So what that means is that, hey, they're not limited to just like these consumer goods, these engineered material goods, you know, kind of um, health hygiene products, right? There is a cross-functionality. So now another client can come to that area and Barry's like, hey, we already have the CapEx that we spent on this business here. This fixed cost is done. So now any dollar that we generate above that fixed cost is going to just drop down to our bottom line. Again, very high level. Just I want people to understand when I say operating leverage and what that means is that, hey, your fixed cost gets stuck at a, a certain level, whether they're, they're high or low. Once your, once your costs are meeting that, anything above that, right, is just going to go flow down to the bottom line. Again, yes, I understand the elephant in the room regarding the variable cost of like, hey, resin, how does oil prices affect their the the impact on the resins that they're making and then if there is or the, the resin that they're getting supplied and then also as those prices increase the the cost inflation for the resin 
are they able to pass it on to the, the customer? And again, I will speak to all that later. The question, the short answer is yes, they do pass on these costs to their customers, but there is a lag. It's not like, hey, the price of resin went up, let's say $10. Tomorrow I can go and sell something to a client for $10. You know, that there is a lag to how that happens. You know, I was thinking, total side note, I was like, hey, when I record these podcasts, I should wear like a camelback. So maybe I'll be more efficient, right? Be like Barry, have an efficient supply chain. Just kind of throw the, the Camelback straw in my mouth versus picking up the water bottle, taking the cap off and all that. All right. So a few other things other than, um, you know, other than kind of the scale and their footprint, their ability to source so much volume, um, the large customer base and the large customer base, everyone, I want to be very clear. They have these large clients, right? I just named a few, right? And, and again, this is not proprietary. Literally go, where is their invest? Hughes, go through their, um, prospectus, go through their filings. Like it's all there, right? So this is not just me like, uh, Houdini and just kind of figuring this out through thin air. This is all publicly available information when i say that they have a large and diversified customer base in a, you know attractive markets it's not only that saying like hey hey they have diversified customers right like a craft a starbucks uh you know these more traditional consumer goods companies chemicals companies etc whatever it is right is what is the end use of the products that those companies are making right and what are we th what are our thoughts on that right and that's the one of the i, I can't I even gotten to, to this in my deck but if you think about kind of growing segments, right, of shipping e-commerce, right? What is being shipped? What is being bought, bought and sold in e-commerce? Even packaging, right? The plastic that you see is coming from somewhere. It's coming from a company like Barry Global, right? Very well may be coming from them. So it's also the end use of the customer, of the client of Barry, right? So it's like a it's like a trickle down of like, all right, you have Barry who's sourcing this resin, you know, they're they're making the the resin to, they're taking the they're taking the plastic, making it into a mold, whatever the heck this customer wants, a garment, face mask, adult diapers, whatever the case is, right? You know, covering for food wrap and meat wraps, again, whatever the case may be. Um, then what is the next step beyond that? And who is that end user? And what will the demand be? Because when you're thinking about it, that's the demand that you have to understand is that will this demand be there from an end user to support Barry's business, right? That's what we have to look like, you know, and is there a disconnect there or not? I'm just laughing because I said disconnect, but uh, the, their presentation has something called a Barry valuation disconnect. And it's actually funny. I was gonna I was gonna speak to this in a little bit, so I, I won't get to it now. But it was regarding their free cash flow yield and how I they're just not getting the love because of the leverage on their capital structure, which is so unfound. And and people people look at leverage and just like shit the bricks. They're just like, oh my god, the company has debt. What are we gonna do? Listen, a certain amount of leverage is concerning, but when you're pumping out a billion dollars of free cash flow, relax, people. Like interest is being met. There is a certain stickiness to the customer demand. Uh, so it's it, it's just, it's weird that, it's not weird. I, I understand the concerns, but to the extent where they're not being valued at where they've historically been valued or where their competitors are being valued at in terms of an EBITDA multiple, uh, it, it is just comical. It's like, all right, we clearly know it's because of the leverage. People want to see the debt, you know, the, people want to see uh, maybe leverage ratios come down to three X, three and a half, which management is on pace to do. Um, so getting ahead of myself a little bit there and I'll, I'll speak that in a little bit, but just going through, um, a few more things on top of, uh, what makes it a good business, what makes that business have a good moat, uh, before transitioning into some of the financial metrics that I want to speak to. And I know I jumped the gun a little bit on that, uh, something that I think is really, really neat in, in the DNA of the company almost. And maybe I'm giving them too much credit cause I'm just drinking the Kool-Aid from the, the earnings calls when, when they're talking and, and the investor deck, but is that something that I thought was really fascinating is, um, and I'm taking one step backward. If you look at their prospectus and I, I don't, I don't know if these numbers have changed, but just speaking from when they went public at the time they went public, the company had, um, about 375 employees who had equity in the company. And that made up 20% 
of ownership in the company. So I know a lot of times when people do analysis and they're ripping up companies and they're looking at ratios and valuation and comps and etc. What's really freaking important, I mean, point blank, what is really important is how long, I mean, first of all, is the management team, are they founder led? Has a CEO been there for 10, 10, 10, 15 years? You know, what is that makeup? Do the people who work there have ownership in the company, right? So before they went public and there was obviously some dilution and I'm not sure exactly how the converts and all that stuff work, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, after they went public, but at the time, 20% of the employees owned, uh, excuse me, had uh, ownership and equity in the company, right? So obviously, again, post going public, yes, there was, you'd say that, hey, Sajin, that pie was probably predominantly more management, et cetera. But the fact is, is that there was a large amount of people who worked there, who came to work every day, who were like, hey, my wealth is tied up in this company, so I'm not gonna make decisions that are gonna impact this company in five months or 10 months. It's more about five years and 10 years down the line. So looking at management and how they're moving, it's like, hey, the capital raises they're doing, the debt offerings that they're doing, the acquisitions they're undertaking, their growth plans, their, their capital allocation strategies. Is it more to get a quick win to make people happy during earning seasons and you know hit your benchmarks hit your EBITDA marks so then you're, you, you're, you can cash in on your options? Or is it like, hey, let's really spend the time to grow this business into a world, into a behemoth over the next five, a half a decade, decade, right? And, and, and how you see if that alignment is there, is like, hey, is that employee culture and management there? Meaning like, have these people been here for a decade plus? Do they have a five, 10 year bid um, to do that? And I, and I think I was guilty of that. I was guilty of sometimes like, hey, like, is it a good business point blank? Like, what are their metrics? What's free cash flow? What's EBIT? What's operating income? What's interest coverage? Like, let's think about the industry. Bang, 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 you know, and not giving much credence to like, you know, look, for some companies, sure, product services are there. Depending on your time horizon, you may not be concerned about that. But going into I, what I consider a, a value, a longer term value proposition is, hey, is there, um, you know, is management and, and, and are they are their values aligned and congruent with hey we want to make this company successful in a decade in five years in ten years right so again I think uh, that's really important something that is overlooked a lot of times in when people are looking at stocks and people are looking into company just something that's that is often um, overlooked now <laughs> something that I want to get to and I can't believe I've been talking for 27 minutes so I think unfortunately I'm gonna I will have to go to um, a part two of Barry, uh, unfortunately. But before I go into some of the finance metrics that I want to speak to, and that came up because I was talking about how in their uh, in their investor presentation from July, they were talking about, hey, there is this valuation con uh, disconnect that uh, that exists, right? When you look at what they have done historically, is that it seems like, hey, let's lower debt, let's acquire a competitor that's bigger maybe right now the strategy is like hey there could be concerns of like hey if they get down to let's say two and a half turns three turns of leverage will they just then go and acquire another company instead of giving that value and that cash flow back to to shareholders now whether that's a buyback or a dividend again we'll sp speak to that later but the way i look at it is hey i when i talked about some of the the, the why this is a good business what are the moats that they have you know, they're, they're leading market positions, you know, they're not tied to any suppliers, they have a wide variety of customer base and end users, they have a lot of insight into their primary cost that's costing them, right, which is, again, resin, and by being such a large player, what are their, their benefits of that, and also, frankly, by being a large, having a large operational footprint, a few other things that I didn't talk about, and this is a point where I got a little sidetracked, was uh, uh, several years ago, they uh so everyone knows what like thermofoam cups are right there's literally foam cups right uh barry spent and i couldn't get wrong i wish i had this in my presentation somewhere but they they spent maybe 400 million dollars on uh developing and building this uh factory out and, and building out hey this is a foam cup that we're gonna now invest in so our customers can now use it and customers are like hey we are gonna get our foam cups and these thermofoam cups uh from barry global and that is a, just an example of like Barry taking an initiative and ownership of like, hey, how can we continue to develop and invest in and commercialize uh, new products that 
we know our customers are going to use because they know their customers so well, right? They're in this space so well. So they have the insight into like, hey, what sort of changes that we need to make? And ding, ding, ding. When I say changes, what they need to make, everyone, obviously, they have this great page. And again, I know it sounds like I'm drinking the Kool-Aid and I'm really trying not to. Um, again, plastics, you know, we could have a whole separate conversation on, hey, what is the energy that goes into producing plastic? What is the environment of the uh, ecosystem? And, and again, those are real concerns that need to be addressed. But we, we can't overlook the fact that when that eco revolution happens, because it will, right? If, if companies want to make, keep making profits and people want to be here, you know, these sustainability pledges that companies are making, they actually have to make them, right? Because if you don't, we're not going to, we're not going to have a planet, right? So if you think, if you think about it, what's more likely, is it more likely that an established incumbent player like Barry Global is going to lead that eco revolution? Or is it going to be a new upstart, right? That doesn't have a billion dollars in free cash flow or doesn't have 1.2 billion in, you know, TTM uh, EBITDA, right? Who, who's going to be the company that's going to be like, hey, we're in a position, we have the operational footprint, we have the operational expertise, we have the, excuse me, <clears throat> we have the material scientist, uh, we have the wherewithal, the knowledge, the IP, the proprietary technology to be like, hey, how do we continue to push the envelope on making the plastics that we're selling sustainable, right? Who do you think that's going to be? My money is on Barry Global because I'm sh they already have internal benchmarks and standards that they've already hit that they're trying to go and achieve even further by 2025 and 2030, but it's obviously going to be them. And then when that transition happens on a worldwide um, on a worldwide scale, who's going to be there driving that, right? I would venture to hope, I don't want to hope, but I would venture to guess that it would be Barry Global. Now, again, this is why you read earnings calls. This is why you read Qs and Ks and you read news releases, right? Because you're like, hey, are they actually doing what they're going to say? Because a company could get on, make a fancy presentation, move some numbers around and, and report things later. So does it impact EBITDA? You can you can offset things on how you book book entries and have things be held on the balance sheet and you release it later. So it hits, you know, on a, it gets reflected in a following quarter and Listen, there's all sorts of accounting gimmicks and tricks that you can do, but you what you can't do and lie is like Jay Z said, like you know, men lie, women lie, numbers don't, right? So that is why you have to put in the time and effort to be like, hey, you guys said that this was an initiative that you were gonna do. Hey, where is that capital outlay for it? Okay, cool, this capital outlay for it happened. Okay, hey, what is what has been the reaction to it? And have clients been like, hey, receptive to this? It's, and then then it's like, hey, you guys talked about being sustainable and driving change. Well, then it's like, okay, well, hey, what are some of the newer products that have been released? And is there an actual, not only a net savings of like actual cost reductions, but has there been energy savings? And has that, how has that impacted your business? And when I say energy savings, it's like, hey, you know, whereas before it might have cost, a, a, you know, 100 kilowatts to produce something. Now it costs us 50 kilowatts. Again, the 150 are illustrative, but the point being made is that that is a point of following a business and doing fundamental deep dive analysis to see is a company actually saying what they're doing. A uh, little bit of a side note, because I, I know I said that's the whole point of doing fundamental analysis, and, and I'm laughing because you look at what happened this year with AMC and GameStop. The biggest thing I will say, and I'm going to look at the camera for this, is that you could do all the research you want. You could tear up all the Qs, all the Ks, all the earnings call. You could, you could do all your valuations. You could do whatever you want. It does not matter what you think. All that matters is what the market thinks, right? What the market thinks is what the asset will be valued at. If the market says that this asset is valued like gold, it will be valued like gold. If the asset says this value, it's, it's valued like shit, it will be valued like shit. Because that is what, you cannot fight against the market, right? So what the reason I'm prefacing all my analysis and I'm like, hey, they have all this fat free cash flow, their free cash flow yield, operating leverage they have a good they have a they have a good understanding of what their fixed costs are i know i know i'm saying all that and like that's great but the unfortunate reality is is that like hey you can have such conviction in your idea as long as you're good convictions based on actual fact right it's not like i'm saying something arbitrary and i'm saying something like hey you know this might be a good company because like you know some some reason out of thin air like hey i like uh you know, I really like their investor deck or I, I like the name or I'm a fan of the CEO. And um, the point is, is that, hey, do you have a reason with conviction that is backed by facts and, and logic, right? And if so, there might be a disconnect and a valuation, um, uh, 
realignment that needs to happen in terms of like, hey, what is the market value of the company at? And what do you think the company is valued at? Make sure your belief in the value of the company is tied to the intrinsic nature and purpose of the business, right? Like, is there a reason for this business to be alive? Yes, right? Hey, what are their margins? Okay, why do those margins exist? Are those margins sustainable, right? So when you look at a company like Barry, while that disconnect exists, for whatever reason, and I'll get into some of those in part two, because I realize I've been talking for 35 minutes, so I wanna (laughs) wanna kind of wrap up here, and I'll get into some of those in terms of like why I do think that disconnect exists and and how long that disconnect will go. Um, So I'll get into that in part two, but before I close out, um, actually, you know what? I will just dive into, I'll just dive into part two uh, later, but just to give you guys a quick heads up, part two will be, more of uh, hey what is the financial overview of the company year over year what is management guidance been uh what are the analysts saying what are my thoughts on some of their attrition their burn rates uh you know some of their leverage ratios what have been their their free cash flow numbers what is what are they doing with their debt pay downs uh is there room for growth uh is their free cash flow being valued accurately uh, you look at their peers and their comp sets, they're not aligned at all. What's the free cash flow per share? What's the free cash flow yield? The free cash flow yield is fat. I'm sorry, it's great. I think their free cash flow yield is what, 10%? Because what's their share price? $65? Uh, is it 65? I think it is 65. And their free cash flow per share is $7. That's what? Oh, at seven, that's like 10%. That's a 10% free cash flow yield. And I also believe that that is in their earnings deck. If you don't believe me, I'm not. My math is accurate. It's here somewhere. But yeah, it's roughly 10%. Um, It is being, yeah, very undervalued. But so again, uh, in part two, guys, that I'll uh, record probably next week and I'll get into it. I'll cover, again, some of the financial stuff, some of the more negatives of the business. I know I talked glowingly about the positives of the company, but on the next episode, I'll get into some of the negatives, some deep, deeper dive on the financial side. Uh, and then I'm also gonna kind of go into the investment case. Like I said, like what would I do? Uh, would I invest in the company? What would I do as a CEO? And I have some really, really interesting thoughts on um, you know, where my head's at in terms of like how I think Barry can continue to add value and, um, and how it's already doing so, because that's why I'm a believer in the company. So shout out to, to, to Barry Global. Again, everyone's like, wait, Sajin, if you're going to give a glowing assessment, how could you believe the company has any negatives? But with all good things, there's always a negative. So yes, there are some structural concerns, uh, some market concerns as well that I'll dive into uh, on the on the next episode. Uh, and then I'll close it out with also some really, sh- all these analysts asked great, great questions, but the CEO and the CFO um did a great job of answering the questions because I think the I think the, the analysts asked great the, the equity research analysts did great questions were asked so I'm actually really excited to kind of dive into some of those uh, questions as well. Um, you know we were at 38 minutes, but I did want to quickly touch on I was reading some something really really interesting on Barons uh, about where is that article? No 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 no. Oh no, man, there was this great article about, and it's called, the, I'm sure it's, it's obviously a play on the movie, but it's called An Inconvenient Truth, The Growth Slowdown That Goes Beyond uh, the Delta Variant. Great article, I did want to speak to that, but I want to be mindful that we're at the 40 minute mark. I can't believe I talked about Barry Global for 40 minutes. Again, great company. I will speak to uh, some of the more financial stuff, uh, negatives, positives, uh, what I would do and kind of where my head's at for an investment case uh, on the next episode. I'm also going to dive into the earnings call um, a bit as well because they, they, there was some really great insight from there. So, uh, look, guys, I'm I'm really happy that I did this. You know, like this is the first episode, hopefully the first episode. Not hopefully, this is the first episode of my uh, first episode. I was about to say the first episode of money. <laughs> it's the first episode of uh, of many. I'm uh, I'm really excited. Like I said, I love looking at companies and reading investor decks and reading about stocks. And um, so yeah, excited to to keep this going. Anyway, guys, I will catch you guys uh, next week for episode two of Finance Musings. All right, guys, take care. Peace.